Brother Jerry, the pastor here at Friendship Baptist Church, and you are about to watch one of our messages. I hope that during this time that you would prayerfully listen. I hope that the Lord speaks to you, that he uses this message to help you grow. I hope you're able to experience God. I hope you're able to connect with him and connect with our church. I hope that you're able to respond to what he's doing in your life. I hope you enjoy. May the Lord bless you during this time. Good morning. It's good to see everybody this morning. Pretty good crowd today. Uh, so we ought to be able to raise a roof on the place today. It's going to be our welcome song. And you know, uh, with everything going on, we need a friend in Jesus. So what better than to have Jesus as your friend? Y'all tell everybody hello. Wave at them. Whatever you need to do to talk to them. Everybody has trials and temptations. Everybody knows heartbreak, isolation. So we can lay our burdens down. Lay our burdens down. What a thing we have in Jesus. are gone. I see grace on every horizon and forever and ever. Everybody has fears. Everybody got worries. Everybody knows sorrow. Devastation But we can lay our burdens down Lay our burdens lay down, our burdens down. Oh. What a friend we have in Jesus He's to us, my sins are gone I see grace on every horizon And forever and ever Betrayal, for he is faithful, he fills me up and my cup runneth over. No more betrayal, for he is faithful, how he has proven it over and over. No more betrayal, for he is faithful, he fills me up and my cup runneth over. No more betrayal. For he is faithful Over and over Over and over What a friend we have in Jesus He's to us my sins are gone I see grace on every horizon And forever and ever His heart is my home What a friend we have in Jesus Sins are gone, yes. Yeah. I see grace on every horizon, and forever and ever his heart is my home. Forever and ever his heart is my home. Praise the Lord, church. Amen. Oh, it's so good to see y'all's faces this morning. We got all that snow out of our system last week. Praise the Lord. I saw awesome pictures from all the kiddos, and there's a few adults that just wanted to get on there. I saw them too. That's living. I like that snowman. Um, that was really awesome. I really enjoyed it. Like I said, I've been waiting three years to be able, well, four years, I guess, to be able to really see some snow, and, and we just got overwhelmed with snow. And it's nasty the next day, I'll give you that. But uh, that day, just to watch them kids run out and go. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. Amen, church? Amen. Oh, we got a couple announcements here this morning. Um, baby shower is going to be uh, January 23rd. That's next Saturday from 2 to 4 p.m. So January 23rd, and that's for Amber Lightfoot, Hernandez. And so it's under Lightfoot, though. If you go on Amazon to look for the registry, it's Amber Lightfoot. And you can find out there. 
and let's help just love and bless and get that family started off right. And so praise the Lord for that. January 31st is our family Sunday. Looking forward to that. Continue to be in prayer of how that's all going to still in the works of walking through all that and, and making sure uh, we get exactly um, what we feel like the Lord wants out of our family Sundays. And so be in prayer for that. Mill train ministry opportunity. I wanted to share this with you. I've been sending it out on Facebook and also our um, prayer chain. I wanted to just give an announcement to all of us. If you would be interested in helping families that are struggling, whether that's just sickness and illness or whether it's bereavement because they've lost a loved one, you know, there's just some times that it's hard for families to get in the kitchen and make a meal. And so um, we're really, we've been doing this, but uh, it's been a, a lot of the same handful of people that's making the meals. And so I just wanted to open it up. And if you say, hey, maybe I can go pick up a meal or I can make a meal here or there, you'll just get put on a list. And Miss Judy will send out a message and saying, hey, here's a family we want to help. If you are available, say yes. And that's as simple as it is. It's not a commitment of every time, just if you can help. And so there's her number on there. You can see it in the bulletin. Um, you can text her and say, I'd like to be added to that list. Them ladies do an excellent job. It's kind of through the social committee, but she kind of heads that up. And so I'm just thankful for her and the way um, she uh, works with that. And it's just a blessing to love on families. And so thank you all for the way you provide in the meals too. Men's breakfast and ladies' lunches resume in February tentatively. Uh, hoping we're looking good. So we'll go um, for second Saturdays for men's breakfast and third Thursdays for ladies' luncheons, and so that'll be good. Standing Gaps is continuing to happen on Sunday nights, and then we have our Faith at Home stuff still going on, and so looking forward to just the way God's going to move this morning. Are you, church? Yeah. Father God, Lord, you um, amaze me, Lord, and God, um, we're not even worthy of being in this place, Lord, uh, sharing the name of Christ together, Lord. Lord, that's all through um, your grace, and, and Lord, you brought us together this morning to worship you. Lord, uh, I know it may feel like a, a, a crazy morning, Lord, getting kids. I'm learning that, God, getting kids out of the house and getting them all dressed and ready to come to church and, and showing up here, making it on time. God, it just feels like a success right off the bat. But Lord, at the same time, uh, our, our nerves are, are um, everywhere and our, um, it's easy to be distracted. God, but Lord, I pray right now and this time, Lord, as we worship and we sing songs exalting the name of Jesus, that you would give our families a sweet time of worship together right now, Lord Jesus. Lord, um, not for our benefit, uh, Lord, but really for your glory. And God, I pray that as your word is open today and sung through and, and read through and preached through, Lord, and responded to, that you would get glory in all that, God. You are mighty, Lord, and God, we surrender to you this morning. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 All right. This is our birthday and anniversary song. If y'all would stand with us. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises, standing on the promises, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing on the promises, standing on the promises, I'm standing on the promises of God. All right, young lady. I couldn't hear that, so I'm going to say 18. <laughs> Hey, we got another one up here. Oh, yeah, we have another one. How young are you today? Five <laughs> years old. And we got one more. I guess she's back there in the nursery, Miss Linda Vaughn. All right. We better sing happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. I don't have my list. I don't know what's going Whatever on. Lisa puts up there, that's what I'm doing. You did that. Yeah. Oh, uh -huh. 
from Emmanuel's name. The sinner was plunged beneath the blood of God's sin. Since then I walk in forgiveness. All of my guilt was erased. The chains of the past were broken and at last I got saved. Oh, I got saved. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the good. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I've got Jesus. How could I want more? I've received nothing but goodness. I've tested and tasted your grace. I was so lost till I fell at the cross. Oh, I got saved. I'm undone by the mercy of Jesus. I'm undone by the goodness of the Lord. I'm restored and made right. He got a hold of my life. I've got Jesus. How could I want more? The love of God. pray if there's somebody here today in this audience that needs it, Lord, I just pray you touch their hearts right now, God. Prepare their hearts for the message. And God, I pray today that they'd be saved. Amen. We ask you things in your son's precious name. Amen. Amen. Oh, if you want to stand up, brother, I see you get up. Y'all go stand up with us. If you're able, if you're not able, I understand. held by the Savior? I've been held by the Savior. I felt fire from above. All my hopes in Jesus.
Would you lead us in a prayer, please? Our Heavenly Father, God, it's so great to be in your house, Lord. Um, it's just awesome, Lord, to be able to come to your house and worship, lift up our voices to you, Lord, to glorify you, to bless others, Lord. Thank you so much, Lord, for your love. <clears throat> Lord, we love you. We just pray, Lord, for this day's services, Lord. We pray that you'll anoint Brother Jerry, that he'll uh, speak those words that we're in need of. Lord God, I just pray that our hearts are open, our ears are open, Lord, that we receive that word. And God will give you the praise and glory. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 All right. I ain't going to make y'all stand up. I don't know if y'all like this song as much as I do. And I'm singing it on my feet every single time. So if y'all want to stand with us, y'all can stand with us and we'll sing it. Because God turns graves into gardens, bones into armies, seas into highways. And I don't know what you're going through right now, but... God can handle whatever you're That's going right. through if you'll just give it to him. Amen. search the world but it couldn't fill me a man's empty praise and treasures of faith are never enough and if you came along and put me back together
Shame into glory. You're the only. 
Peter said, I know you probably part of some. Uh, with everything going on, you know, uh, there's nothing better than God. And, uh, you know, you hear a lot of things going around, different stories about this and different stories about that and all the politics and all of that. But, you know, a lot of that's fear. And we don't need to live in fear because fear is a lie. So this is the song we're going to sing right now. Y'all sing it with us. And listen to the words and just remember that fear is a lie. And you can probably deal with part of this and probably put you right on the head of what's going on in your life. When he told you you're not good enough, when he told you you're not right, when he told you Just come to you, Lord. 
Lord, we know fear is a liar, God, and I just pray that you just put that in everybody's hearts today, God, with the message that's coming with Brother Jerry this morning, Lord. Don't believe nothing fear's got to say, God. You're the only way, and that's who we need to turn to and look to. Lord, we ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Amen. All right, I believe I still got some youngins in here. If y'all would come forward, if y'all would come up here, right here, walk if you can. Now, I got something to ask y'all. I don't know if y'all going to like it or not. Might bring back some bad memories. Y'all doing okay today? Uh-huh. We're in pretty dresses. So just a reminder, this is all the way up to fifth grade, but the first through fifth graders stay in here, and the ones kindergarten under will go back for children's church. But first through fifth graders, if you get your um, packet, kids packet, there you thank you, Ralph. Um, I, you get your kids packet whenever you leave. It's got a bulletin, all that good stuff. But I got a question to ask you. Have you ever heard these words? Listen real close. Do you want a whooping? You never heard those words before? No. I heard those words a few times. What about this? You want me to take off my belt? No. Yep. yep. <laughs> <laughs> you know what those things are called? Or maybe in, in our house, what we're doing right now, it's called, do you, know what, you remember what it's called, Caleb? When you get in trouble, where do you go? No. The talking chair, that's right. So we're doing the talking chair, and, and uh, it's um, all kinds of different ways you do this thing I'm wanting to tell you about. It's called discipline. Can you all say discipline? Discipline. Discipline is something that mommy and daddy do, and they, they try to work with you, and, and, and it's out of love. Sometimes we think spankings and talking chairs and all these different things that we talk about. Um, all these different things are, are um, really scary and really hard, but the truth is, is they're done out of love. Did you all know that? It's hard to believe, isn't it? <laughs> but it really is done out of love, and it's to help us because when we get in trouble, it's because we do something we're not supposed to, right? Is that how we get in trouble? We do something we're not supposed to, and so then um, someone's got to come in and say, hey, you're not really supposed to do that. We need to try better, and if we don't try better, then consequences or discipline comes in. And so that's something that we all deal with as we're raising up, and the truth is, is we probably all need to be self-disciplined a little bit, Amen. And, but when we're younger, it helps for mom and dad to help discipline us. But in the church, I want to talk today about church discipline. Because as a church, it's something we do out of love too. As we walk with one another, with brothers and sisters. Y'all know we call each other brothers and sisters here. And so we're a family and we help discipline one another. We help walk with it. Self-discipline, but also a discipline with one another. Isn't that cool, Caleb? No, oh, buddy, I think it's cool. Is it cool, sweeties? Yeah, there we go. You might need a little discipline when we leave here. Um, so, y'all remember the row. We all, as soon as we leave here, we go and get our buckets. If you're in here, if you go in the back, you go straight to the back. Y'all say amen? Amen. All right, I want to pray. Does anybody want to pray for me? Go ahead, Trip. Pray for us, buddy. Amen. Thank you, Trip. Y'all go ahead and walk back. Praise the Lord, church. Amen. Y'all are already terrified. Y'all look like them faces of them kids when I said discipline. Me and Caleb's going to have to have some talking. <laughs> Welcome to parenthood, amen? It's been a journey, but it's been thankful. I'll just go ahead and tell you, thank you for everybody that's praying for us as we uh, are, are taking this new adventure on. We're really having a blast, but it is extremely hard. Can I get an amen from some parents out there? Yeah, there we go. 
Father God, Lord, we are so thankful for you, Lord. We're so thankful for the God that you are. Lord, the one that we can come to, uh, knowing that you're a heavenly Father that loves us, God. Lord, that has a grace that abounds and that's sufficient, Lord, and that overwhelms us, God. I just thank you for who you are, Lord. And God, as we come to your word today, I pray that, God, you would just open up our hearts to what it is to be received, Lord. Lord, your message, your word, God, something that was inspired um, from you, Lord, but also something that the Holy Spirit helps us illuminate and see, Lord, and, and to respond to today. And so, God, I just pray that as we do this, Lord, that you would just be um, the main character here today, God. Lord, that you would hide me behind your cross and that we would just simply hear from the words of Christ. Lord, we love you, and it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So, last week we or continued on through Corinthians, so that's where we'll be. Y'all can go ahead and turn your Bibles to 1 Corinthians, and we'll get there in a minute. But I want to just remind you, so last week we kind of talked about this idea of Paul really calling them out and saying, hey, you're still babes in Christ. Remember, he says they were carnal, or they were fleshly, or they were weak. He says, by this time, you should be on the meat of the gospel, but you are still where you can only receive the milk of of the gospel. And so we had this, this word from 1 Corinthians last week, and, and we looked at that. And so today we find ourselves back at this place in 1 Corinthians. And you know, as we preach through the word of God, this is um, why I enjoy doing it the way we do it here, of trying to go through books. I, I separate from that every once in a while, but I try to go from chapter one all the way to the end. And the reason for that is because if it wasn't for that, I probably would never turn to this passage and preach it. <laughs> Not because of... of um, um, any, uh, any, not because it's not valid or it's not real or it's not edifying, but because it's hard. And, you know, um, it's kind of like a parent giving discipline sometimes. Sometimes that's hard to do, isn't it? Sometimes you really, it hurts your heart and, and you, you have to walk through that. And it's the same way Paul is addressing this church, and we're even going to see the very first point that we're going to get to here in a little bit, is, is that he does it from a father's heart. But I'm not there yet. I just want us to think about what's happening here because we're talking about something very, very serious. It's called church discipline. And if you want to know my honest opinion, this is something you hear me talk about a, a lot, really. I, I use this words, and if you went through Friendship 101, um, we even talked about church discipline and what that is and that it's an expectation as we gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ. But today we get to dig into it a little bit more. And so we're going to finish up chapter four, first Corinthians chapter four, and then we're going to get into chapter five and six. But again, I think I truly believe that this topic, church discipline, is something that the churches in our world today really struggle with. I really do. I, and I don't think we're exempt from that. I think as a whole, as churches together, we really struggle with this idea of discipline. Just like a child struggles with discipline. It's not natural. It's not easy. And so when we come to this idea of church discipline, I want us to approach it very um, humbly and very open hearted and that we'd see God move to this. Because honestly, I believe the reason that a lot of our churches are in the state that they are in is because of the lack of church discipline. I truly believe that. When you think about a child or someone even as an adult that hadn't had a lot of discipline in their life, what do you get? It's not a really pretty picture, is it, church? We use words like spoiled or um, we use words like uh, disrespectful or those that are just kind of self-absorbed. And that usually happens. Those things come from a lack of discipline in someone's life. So when you think about a church... It's really no different. If you have no discipline in a church, you're going to see a church as a group of people that are self-absorbed, that are disrespectful, that um, are spoiled in a sense. And so I want us to, y'all are giving me some weird looks this morning. I know, I know it's going to be tough this morning, but you know what? It's God's word. Amen. Do we need it? Yes. Thank you. So as we come to this, I, I just... I really approach it with fear and trembling, if you want to know, honestly. I come today with fear and trembling as we open up God's word, because like I said, it's in fear and trembling because I believe that this is a place that most of our churches are not obedient to the word of God. in. It's a it's fear and trembling that I come to this because it's completely countercultural. When we talk about someone else disciplining us, is, isn't that countercultural? Doesn't that make something that's not comfortable for me and you? So it's with fear and trembling that I come. It's a desire that I would see Friendship Baptist Church 
with me and y'all included as a body, as a family of Christ, be even more obedient to God's word as we get into this today. And so I want to do this with a humble attitude and I want to come to it with just open eyes, spiritual eyes and open ears. So go ahead and pray with me again. Father God, Lord, I pray that through your word today that you would bring discernment. God, that as we open up 1 Corinthians and finish up chapter 4 and we get into 5 and 6, Lord, that you would not let this just be one of them passages that we come to every once in a while. We're like, wow, that was hard and and not really um, address it or do anything with it. But Lord, as you've laid this before us in your providence and in your sovereignty, Lord, as you've brought um, all all the people, I see many guests out here today, Lord, and Lord, that's all in your own hand. I don't know exactly how and why you do things sometimes, but Lord, this is your will, God, today. I know it is, Lord. And so, Lord, as we open it up, we pray that you would help us not reject the spirit, not quench the spirit, but that it would flow uh, mightily, Lord, in and through us and that we would heed to a word from from the Lord, from you, Lord. God, maybe it just simply bring about a, a, a spirit of repentance that we need today. God, just move, move today, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. The first point Chapter 4, verse 14, we're going to get to this point that God, or that Paul here, that Paul is really warning them, and it comes from the heart of a father. And so, look at verse Corinthians, chapter 4, verse 14, if you're there, say amen. It says, I do not write these things to shame you, listen to his heart, I don't write them to shame you, but as my beloved children, I warn you, for through For though you might have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Therefore I urge you, imitate me. For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ, as I teach everyone in every church. Now some are puffed up as though I were not coming to you, but I will come to you shortly if the Lord wills. And I I will know not the word of those who are puffed up, but the power. And we know from earlier, he's talking about the gospel. They're from the gospel and the work of the gospel. Verse 20, for the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What do you want? Shall I come to you with a rod or in love and a spirit of gentleness? And so he says, this whole letter that I'm writing to you, this whole passage that I'm getting ready to open up and, and address you with, isn't to be um, done out of, of shaming you. And so as we are looking at me and, 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 and thinking about what this message is about, it is not about shame. Amen, church? It's not a shameful message here this morning at all. It's a message of warning, not from me, but from the Lord, from him and his hand. And so as we think about that and we walk through that, let, let's Focus in on what's being said here. He says, you may have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet you have not many fathers, for I have begotten you in Christ through the gospel. You know, there's a difference between the heart of an instructor and a heart of a father. Y'all realize that, right? When you think about a heart of an instructor, that's a powerful heart. It's a lot more powerful than mine in some senses. When I think about teachers and those that instruct our children and, 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 and Sunday school teachers, instructing is tough and it takes a wonderful heart to do that. And you think about the instructor's heart, it would include things like just wanting them to understand. You're, you're communicating in a way to try to get them to understand. You desire that. You desire to see them succeed. You want them, you want to personally instruct well. And so you think about an instructor's heart, you do care for the child. Amen. Teachers, I didn't hear many of you out there. Amen? Amen. All right. But a father's heart is this and so much more, isn't it, church? They have the same heart. They, they want the, the child to, to, to understand and, and discern. They, they want to, to instruct them in that way. They want them to succeed. But there's more to a father's heart. There's a deep connection. There's a deep love there that's not there with a, a, a teacher or an instructor. Now, there is love there, but I'm talking this deep, connected love. A father has got more influence then than a regular instructor. There's a special devotion. And Paul says, I've begotten you. I've done that in the name of Christ. He says, in Christ, I've done that through the gospel. And so I want us to catch this. Paul's not saying, call me father. In fact, the Bible says elsewhere not to call any man father. We have a heavenly father. That's not what Paul's addressing here. He says, 
the way I'm addressing you, the way I'm talking to you is the heart of a father. I want you to know I love you. You're in my heart, and, and, and he makes sure that they know salvation didn't come through him. He didn't begot them on his own. It was in Christ through the gospel. Salvation comes in Christ through the gospel. However, God gave him this special role, this connection, and told them to imitate himself. He says, imitate me. But again, this isn't about Paul. If you look at verse 17, I think it is, it says um, that you are to imitate me. And I sent Timothy, my son, faithful one, to show you all my ways in Christ. And so it's not about the way Paul's walking here. It's about the way he's walking in Christ. And so make sure we, we get this understanding here. But again, when you think about a father and a father's heart, there's this natural connection and imitation, right? I'm learning this. Uh, I was uh, fixing my hair and uh, y'all know I got a big boy haircut now. I'm a big boy. So I actually have to use gel and all that crazy stuff. And uh, Caleb come walking in, and he's like, can you fix my hair like that? So yeah, he wanted to imitate me. And so I, I got the gel out, and I fixed his hair up, gave him the little comb over with the whatever you call that. And, and uh, he was like, I look handsome, don't I? I said, yeah, buddy, you do. And so, but then just last night, we're at the table, and, and I'm eating chicken nuggets with him. And, and uh, he says, and they're ranch fans. But they are all about ranch, and they always get ranch with everything from the for last two whole weeks, every meal. And he said last night, can I have some ketchup like you? <laughs> that's just this imitation. It's, that's all it is. That's all that is. It's a connection that's, that God's building there from a father's heart. And that's how Paul's writing here. He's saying, look, I have a connection with you, my heart. I, I love you, and, and I want you to imitate me in the way I walk with Christ. That's my desire. And so as we get to this topic of church discipline may the tone be set here this morning from a father's heart from love from god's word from his message and so there's the first point here and so and, and it comes uh, before i really get to the end of that i want to focus on what he says next he says if the lord wills i will take account of how you respond to this warning is what he's really getting at there at the verses 18 to 21 and and his point is is some people were saying, oh, Paul's never going to come back. He's got his own missionary journeys that he's doing, starting churches. He's never going to come back here. Why should we ever listen to Paul? And Paul says, oh, I'm coming. <laughs> I'm coming. If the Lord wills, I'm coming. He says, I'll be there. He says, the question is, is when I get there, how do you want me to approach you? With a rod or with gentleness and love? He says, how will you respond to this? And so then is when we get into the meat here, this next part, chapter or the, the chapter five. If you're there, say amen. The second point this morning is that Paul then strongly encourages the Corinth church to enact church discipline, to carry out church discipline. So here's where we're going to see this, this topic, this theme. And so at 1 Corinthians chapter five, verse one, it says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and such sexual immorality as it is not even a named among Gentiles, that a man and his father's wife lay together, and you are puffed up and have not rather mourned that he who has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I indeed, as absent in body, but present in spirit, have already judged as though I were present him who has done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, listen to what he says here in verse 4. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together along with the, my spirit, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. Wow. Visitors are thinking, I'm never coming back to this church. It's God's word, though. Amen. Amen. It's straight from his word. What do we do with that? That's some harsh language. That's hard language. Let's, let's take that in. Let's figure out what he's saying here. Because I think initially what he's doing is he's calling them out. Just like he called them out for their immaturity and said, you're still babes and you need to be taking me by now. Now he's saying, look, there's issues in the church that you're not even addressing. You're not even addressing them. He, he starts talking about it. He calls them out for not carrying out church discipline, not addressing these issues. That's what church discipline is, is addressing sin issues. And so he calls them out and says, don't you realize, I know you realize, that there's a man in your church 
that's sleeping with his father's wife. And so most likely a, a stepmom here is kind of what we would associate that with. And so a stepson and a stepmom are, are together. And, and I want us to catch something that says that he has his father's wife. Not had, not repented. There's a sense that I want to get to here in a little bit of its unrepentant sin that we're, not, we're talking about. So when we're talking about church discipline, I'm not talking about us being sin police, just walking around and saying, oh, there it is. Oh, there it is. You need to straighten up. It's when we see someone over and over again, because we all struggle. I get that. But when you see a brother or a sister that's struggling over and over again in a sin that's got them entangled, we can't just leave them ensnared. We can't just leave them begging for life and, 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 and the, the thirst of living water while they're quenched by Satan's hands. No, we got to come to them and say, hey, sister, hey, brother, I see you struggling. Let's work with this. I want to talk about that a little bit more. But that's the mentality as we're getting here is a man who has his father's wife. It's not one who had and repented. It's one that has and is unrepentant. We'll see. We'll keep going here. But I want us to catch this. And he says, he says, this is terrible, even worse than the Gentiles. And then he gets in this idea of, of you realize you're, you're arrogant here. You're puffed up rather than mourning. Let that sink in a minute, church. You're puffed up or arrogant. Puffed up is another way of really saying inflated by man's wisdom. That's the way I, I kind of interpret puffed up. It's being inflated, taking in man's wisdom versus God's wisdom. And so when we take in our own wisdom and reject God's wisdom, we kind of get puffed up with this idea that, that we know. We get this arrogance about us. And, and I think that's what's so interesting here is, is he's saying one of the reasons you're not dealing with this is because you're puffed up with your own wisdom. I'm sure someone was saying, well, um, it's not really, uh, it's just kind of one of them things, you know, or we don't really need to address that or whatever man's wisdom puts in there. But God's word is God's word. And, and we see where he says, no, this is worse than even the Gentiles. Let's address this. And so I think what's interesting to me is the reason they had not enacted church discipline was that they were too puffed up in their own wisdom rather than God's wisdom. Some way or other, they were too inflated in their own wisdom to address blatantly sexual immorality, sin. And today, the same thing happens. Why do we not have church discipline in our, our churches? Why do we not save, or, or not that we do the saving, but uh, attempt to help the person yield to the Spirit to, to escape from Satan's snare and, and his trap? Why do we just leave him there? Well, it's because we get puffed up in our own wisdom, and, and we start saying crazy things like, well, who are we to judge? That's man's wisdom. God tells us, in fact, in the next chapter, he's going to say the, the saints are going to judge the world. We are to judge. The whole fact of, of we're not to judge is man's wisdom that has puffed up the churches into being a, a, a lazy church is what it really boils down to in which that we don't even care about each other. He says, how do you get here? And some other man's wisdom, I think, is, is don't we all mess up? Don't we all struggle? How can I point my finger? And, and, and I think those are done with the right heart sometimes. But it's a deceived heart, one that's deceived by being puffed up with our own wisdom. And I want to walk through this just a little bit more with you. Another point that I think Paul makes here is that church discipline is something that is to be done as a body. As a body. This is so important, church. He says that he's absent. But he says, as if I was present, he says, I've, I've judged them. And this isn't an authoritative judge. This is a discerning judge. He says, I've judged them and, and I see this wrong. He says, so when you gather and he starts walking through this in a minute, but he, he says, you as a body are to do this. And I think about this church discipline is not carried out by pastors and elders. And I think that's where it's messed up in churches before in the past when the pastor starts taking that role. That's not my role. Now, do I play a role in that? Yeah, I'm, I'm to protect and shepherd and, and the flock. Absolutely. But at the end of the day, church discipline is to be done by the church, not by the pastor or the elders. It's not to be done by the deacons. The deacons play a role of trying to keep unity in the midst of it. But the deacons are not the responsible ones of doing church discipline. Church discipline is to be done by the body is what we're getting here as Paul's writing this. And he starts walking through what this actually looks like. So look at verse 4 again. He says, In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you are gathered together, along with my spirit, Paul saying, with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that 
his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. And again, that's so hard to hear. Because my mind and my heart goes to, what about the adulterous woman, Jesus? You were the one that, that literally looked at her and, and they were all talking about her sin and, and you were drawing in the sand and, and then all of a sudden you, you tell them, hey, whoever has not sinned, cast the first stone. Who has not sinned? Cast the first stone. And they all drop their stones and they walk away because they can't cast a stone. You remember that passage? But what does Jesus say afterwards? Get up. You've been forgiven. Go and sin no more. We see a repentant heart. Totally different church. And so when we hear the words church discipline, don't think about those that are just messing up. Think about those that are entangled and ensnared with an unrepentant heart. That's what we're talking about here. Now, does, it a, does that kind of have a process and a progress to that? Absolutely. Can we get in the midst of that to check people's hearts, one another's, not in a police way, but in a loving way? Absolutely. I pray that we're having conversations about our hearts and our small groups and our D groups. And when we're visiting across the table, would we talk about the conditions of our heart, church? Amen? But Paul's not the one that makes all this church discipline up. It comes from Matthew 18 when Jesus says this. Matthew chapter 18. I got it on the screens, I believe. It says in verse 15, Moreover, if your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he hears you, you have gained your brother. If he repents, you've gained him. Praise the Lord. Verse 16, though, but if he will not hear, take with you one or two more. And we kind of use that as the deacons or the elders and the pastors at times, the one or two more, that by the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. And if he refuses to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he refuses even to hear it from the church, let him be to you like a heathen and a tax collector. Those are Jesus' words, church. Again, hard. What does he say next? Assuredly, I say to you, whatever you bind on earth, you will be bound in heaven. And whether you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, I say to you that where two or three are agree on earth concerning anything that they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered together in my name, I am there in the midst of them. So the whole where two or three are gathered, we say that all the time is in the context of church discipline. What Jesus is saying here, he says, where we're gathered and the Spirit is reigning and we're walking through with that. And so, real simple, church. Someone sins against you, you go to them and say, hey, what's going on here? I, I felt like that wasn't really kind. I felt like that was sinful. And if they repent and say, I'm sorry, I didn't mean it that way, or I did mean it that way, I'm really sorry, I just had a rough day, or... or, or you know, I was completely in the wrong, knew I was in the wrong, but I'm sorry. Praise the Lord. You've gained your brother. You've gained your sister. But if they don't repent and they say, eh, I'm not going to deal with that, then that's when you take two or three witnesses. It tells us very clearly what Jesus says. You go to them. Praise the Lord if they repent. If they don't, it says take it to the church. Now that's where we get a little fuzzy. What does that mean? And that's when I say I feel like as churches we struggle with this because Honestly, I haven't hardly been part of church where I've ever seen it taken to the church when it probably needed to be taken to the church several different times. So what does it look like? That's what Paul's getting at here. He says, this is what that looks like. He says, it is to be done in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. If you ever take it to the church, it better be done in the name of Jesus. Not in the name of your church. Not in the name of an elder or deacon or anyone else or a pastor. It is to be done in the name of Jesus. It keeps us accountable, church. It's not about saving anyone else or saving any church. It's about saving the name of Christ. Let it be done in His name. It is to be done when gathered. It's not a secret meeting that happens with a few elders in the, the, the rooms. It's, it's to be as gathered. It's said, he says, Paul says to do it along with his spirit. Now, we don't have Paul anymore and we don't have his spirit in that sense, but we have his words. We have God's words that God inspired anyway. So it should always be done in line with the scriptures. With power or the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is a gospel of restoration, one that desires one to be restored and not condemned. And then deliver such a one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that his spirit may be saved. This one catches us off guard. What do you mean, Paul? What do you mean, God? How do we deliver one to Satan? 
for the destruction of his flesh that his spirit might be saved. What in the world does that mean? Well, I'll tell you what it means. It's not condemnation. It's restoration. You see that in John chapter 3. I'm not sure if I have this on the screen. Just listen if I don't. John 3 verse 18. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation that the light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light that his deeds may be clearly seen that they have been done in God. And that's what Paul's getting at, that the spirit may be saved. He says, all this darkness stuff we got to do away with. Christ is the light. Let it be revealed of, of what's really going on. Has it been done in God? And let's walk through this. He says, if it is, then we hand them over to Satan if they're unrepentant. What does that mean? Well, Job has some familiar language. If you read the book of Job, Job 2, 6 says, And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. And then the whole rest of the story of Job, what happens? Satan is literally destroying the flesh of Job. The boils and losing his family and his how everything. Satan is taken and destroying his flesh. But what's the gracious purpose at the end of Job? Job 42, 6 through 7 says, I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eyes see you. Therefore, I abhor, I despise or reject myself and repent in dust and ashes. And you think, is that really grace, Pastor? Yes. It's always God's grace that allows our eyes to see him and to reject ourselves and exalt Christ. That's God's grace, isn't it, church, that we are brought into that. So Paul references his own um, flesh's destruction even by Satan too. In 2 Corinthians 12, 7, he says, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelation, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I be exalted above measure. He says, A messenger of Satan has been given to me, this thorn of flesh. What is Paul saying? He says his flesh is being destroyed. Well, for what purpose? That he may not be exalted, that Christ would remain exalted, that he would know that his grace is sufficient that we learn from 2 Corinthians. This is amazing to me. We know that salvation only comes through the name of Jesus. Amen? And so when we read this verse and we think about handing someone over to Satan for the destruction of flesh that the spirit may be saved. What that shows us is Satan at his best is still yet under the thumb of God. Praise the Lord, church. This means that for Christians, God even uses Satan in the destruction of our flesh to sanctify us. He uses Satan in the destruction of our flesh to make us more holy. And this gives light to things for me like cancer, or AIDS, or any other disease. Because if you think about those, what are those? Well, that's ways that Satan destroys our flesh. It's because of sin that diseases are in the world. And so we see these things are because of Satan's hand of destroying our flesh. However, I've got the privilege of walking through with so many people that are suffering through those things in which they have the same response that Job has. And they say, I've heard with my ear, but now my eyes have seen you. Now I may repent. Praise God. Helps me see a little differently what we go through and how Satan works in the midst of things and how God is still sovereign over that. It's done in the name and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. The third point I want us to get this morning. Church discipline is God's way of purifying His own bride as He, the bridegroom, will return to bring His bride to a great wedding banquet. So church discipline is a way that God uses to purify his bride. And guess what, church? We are his bride if we're in Christ. And he's our bridegroom. Think about that anticipation of your wedding. You all remember that? You are thinking, who that's many years ago. Mine was uh, four and a half, five years ago. 2016? Yeah. And I remember, um, I remember that day being so nervous. Literally, I puked that morning. <laughs> I was nervous. And I remember just anticipating my bride walking down the aisle. And I think about the bridegroom. Things were a little different. Customs were a little different. But the same anticipation of seeing the groomsmen with the bride. 
And that's how God looks to us and he says, in the meantime, I'm purifying you that you may be a holy and be a, a bride without blemish when I come back for you. Praise God. It comes from the words of Jesus. Matthew 22 says this, and Jesus answered and spoke to them again by parables and said, the kingdom of heaven is like a certain king who arranged a marriage for a son and sent out servants to call those who are invited to the wedding and they were not willing to come. And again, he sent out other servants saying, tell those who are invited, see, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle are killed and all these things are ready. Come to the wedding. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his own farm and another to his own business. And the rest seized his servants and treated them spitefully and killed them. But when the king heard about it, he was furious and he sent out armies, destroyed those murderers who burnt up their city. Then he said to the servants, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Therefore, go into the highways as many are as you find. Invite to the wedding. So the servants went out of the highways and gathered together all they found, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to the guest, he saw a man who did not have a wedding garment. And so he said, friend, how did you come here without a wedding garment? And he was speechless. And then the king said to the servant, bind him hand and foot, let him away and cast him into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Few for many are called, but few are chosen. What is he saying here when Jesus uses these words? He says, I'm preparing a banquet and the day will come where there'll be a lot there. But the only the ones who have the wedding garment will be the ones that get to enjoy the banquet. What is the wedding garment? It's Christ the Son who cleanses us. That's what Paul's getting at when he finishes up chapter 5, verse 6 through 8, and you start reading through this. It says, Your glorying is not good. Do not know that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. Therefore, purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump since you are truly unleavened. For indeed, Christ, our Passover, was sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast, not with old leaven, nor with the leaven of malice or wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. What is he saying? He says, without church discipline, sin ruins a whole body. It ruins a whole body is what he's saying. Without it, it does. It's like leaven. It takes a little leaven to leaven the whole lump and it's all bad, he says. He says, and he compares it to the, the Passover and he starts talking about the Passover lamb and the feast that comes. And after the Passover, they wouldn't be able to have um, leavened bread in their house because it was a representation of sin. And so we see this idea of him saying, we are truly unleavened because Christ has cleansed us. Therefore, get rid of the old leaven, the malice and the wickedness. Get rid of it and put on sincerity and truth. That's the leaven, the unleaven, he says. In fact, he says, I've already told you this in my first epistle, the one we don't have. And he starts walking through this and, and he starts talking about how, he says, I told you not to even eat with those that are sexual and moral or those that are struggling with the sins. And he walks through this. Let me just read it. I wrote to you in my epistle not to keep company with sexual and moral people. Yet I certainly did not mean with the sexual and moral people of this world or with the covetous or the ex extortioners or idolaters since you would need to go out of the world but now i have written to you not to keep my company with anyone named a brother who is sexually immoral or covetous or idolater or reviler or a drunkard or extortioner not even to eat with such a person for what have i to do with judging those who are outside do you not judge those who are inside but those who are outside God judges, therefore put away from yourself the evil people. He says, I already talked to you about this. He says, don't, I'm not saying don't mingle with sinners. He says, that's impossible. In fact, that's not missional. He says, what I'm telling you is to not mingle with so-called brothers who profess Christ, who are dealing and caught up and ensnared in those sins unrepentantly. That's what he's getting at here. Why? So that Satan would destroy the flesh, yet the spirit may be saved. And that we would see restoration and we would see purification. It says here in chapter 6, what happens is, he, right before that, in the end of chapter 5, he says, God judges those on the outside, but we judge those that are on the inside. Talking about inside the church, that's our, our role. And then the whole chapter 6 
there at the beginnings about, he starts talking about suing one another, how a brother shouldn't sue another brother or a sister shouldn't sue another sister, this idea of suing one another. But the whole purpose of this passage is, is really tying in with discipline and with the way we judge. He says, don't take your judgment outside of the church. To the, to the unrighteous is what he's getting at. I don't have time to read it this morning. But I want you to go and read that when you leave. And I want you to think about what's really happening here. Paul is saying the purpose of this is that you wouldn't take your concerns and your, your sin battles with one another outside of the church to where the lost can see it. And that the effectiveness and the testimony of the church be ruined. That's what he's getting at here. He says, don't you know that saints will be the judge of the world? Why do you take them to the unrighteous? He says, wouldn't it be better if you would just be wronged or cheated than to find yourself in that place. He says, instead, what you end up doing is cheating and wronging them. But then he says, don't you remember who the unrighteous are? He says, fornicators, idolaters, um, adulteresses, homosexuals, sodomites, thieves, covetous, drunkards, violers, and extortioners. And he says, and such were you. But you were saved, you were sanctified, and you were justified. He says, you're no better than any of them. This isn't a message of being better and a judgment coming from your own authority. This is church discipline that happens because of us recognizing it's all through the grace of God that any of us walk with Christ. And then he goes on in chapter 6, verse 12 through 20, and he really comes back to this idea of wrapping it back up to the sexual immorality that we're dealing with in chapter 5. The man sleeping with his father's wife that's how he wraps all this back up and i wanted to get through that because that's the chunk here that all comes together i wanted to make sure we grasped it in context so you can go and finish that until you get to chapter seven we'll start seven next week but i want us to think about this what he gets to at the end he says when you are dealing with that sin you're committing sin against your own body sexual morality here specifically he says you you're combining with a harlot he says but you're not to be united with a harlot if you're in christ you're already united with christ Christ doesn't unite with a harlot. He cleanses us. That's the whole purpose of the gospel. So he's saying that he reminds us that sin defiles the very purpose of the gospel. The gospel was to defeat sin so we could unite with Christ rather than being united with sin. So church, as we come to this right now, I told you it's with fear and trembling that I come to this passage. I pray that God has worked just, just, just in any way in your heart this morning. And my prayer is, is that he would have brought you, and if not now and already, but he would do right now, bring you to a place of repentance. Don't we all need to be in a humble place of repentance? That should be a constant state, a posture we have before the Lord Jesus. And so I'm just praying that right now, maybe the Lord would bring a spirit of repentance on our church. And that, that we would see obedience to this. Maybe we would even see a brother or sister in here right in these pews come up to another and say, hey, I'm struggling and, and I just want to pray with you. And, and I feel like we, there's been sin in our relationship and I want to pray through that with you. Maybe that happens at the altar today. Maybe that happens on the phone as you leave this place. Maybe God would just do something so miraculous of saying we can't let someone continue ensnared sin and that we just walk through that with them in love with the hope of restoration. Would that happen today, maybe? If God wills it to happen, the spirit of, of, his, of, of humility and gentleness and love might come upon this place and we see restoration in relationships. I pray more than anything that we would just be reminded of the sweet gospel of Jesus Christ, that it saved us as we were such. And if that hasn't happened and you find yourself in here today and you say, you know, I, I really know that I've had this sin issue, but I've really not cared and you say, I think it's really because I'm not in Christ. If after you walk through this today, I really wonder if I'm even in Christ and I want to walk through that with you. I'm here to, to counsel and walk through that with you. Maybe you've just said today, you know what? God, you have opened my eyes. My ears have heard, but now my eyes have seen and I am saved because I know there's a repentance that's come over my heart. And I want you to be exalted, Lord. And we celebrate in that salvation today. Father God, Lord, you, my Lord, our Lord, God, I pray that, that you would bring about a, a, a spirit of repentance, Lord. God, as I read this passage, what it shows me is that the Corinth church wanted you, Jesus, as the pardoner of sin, but they did not want you as their purifier. 
Lord, help us not only desire you to pardon us, but to purify us, Lord. Maybe today we just come broken before you saying, I know that I've, I've struggled with this and I just want you to take it, God. Lord, let there not be a sense of, of, of judgment and authoritative sense of, of holier than thou or anything like that. But God, may we look at one another and say, I love you enough to pray with you in this. I love you enough to walk with you in this. In fact, it's something God restored me of, and, and I know he has the hope of restoring you in. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would just work miraculously right now, God. Would you bring about your grace and maybe even salvation in this place? In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. If you would stand with us. I'm going to kind of reiterate what Brother Jerry said. If you would, just bow your head and close your eyes and search your heart. Search your heart this morning. And whatever God leads you to do, then do it. Praise to God this morning. Praise the Lord, church. Would He continue to work in us and those visiting this morning? I'm so glad that y'all got to come, and, and it's just been a blessing to worship with you this morning. A little different message, but it's God's word. Amen, church. And that's what we're going to preach is God's word. I want to ask um, to remind you that we have a business meeting tonight, and we'll continue our standing in the gaps tonight. And uh, I'm looking forward to that. And so if y'all would come and be a part of that, it'd be a blessing. And then, yes, I knew I was forgetting something, Rebecca. Y'all come on down here. Oh, you're connected. <laughs> For the bang, brother. <laughs> Sebastian and Rebecca Serato has been um, visiting with us for a good while now, but they've wanted to. There we go. I'll just. <laughs> so Sebastian and Rebecca Serato and their family um, of wanting to join our church this morning. That's why they've come forward. And so you have Serenity and Harmony and Ariel, too. And so um, we're excited about that happening. Um, it'll be through a statement of faith. And we had the baptism with Rebecca already. You already heard her testimony. And so I'm just excited about uh, them walking with us, us coveting with them and them coveting with us. And so I just need a motion for that. 
Roy Scholl's made a motion. I got a second with Miss Beverly. All in favor, say amen. 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 All right, y'all make sure you get to know their story. It's quite phenomenal. From Columbia and some awesome things uh, that God does in Columbia, too. It's all, all cool to listen through. I know he'd love to share it with you. Maybe even a, eat a Colombian meal with you. Yeah. yeah.